Здравейте, вие сте свръх човекът с Георги Ненов подкастът, който всеки вторник ви разказва истории, които вдъхновяват. Днешният ми гост е Робърт Влах. Той е от Чехия и ще си говорим на английски. Автор е на книгата Пътят на предприемача или The Freelancer Way. Малко повече за него и неговата история ще чуем след малко. Сега искам да благодаря на партньорите на подкаста, благодарение на които и този епизод достига до вас. Преминаването на свърх човекът с Георги Енов към видео нямаше да бъде възможно без подкрепата на Динафос. Затова с Монката искрено ги препоръчваме като място, на което можеш да намериш продукти и решения за фото, видео, бродкаст и кинооборудване, както за любители, така и за професионалисти. От създаването си през 2003 година екипът на Динафос има една основна ценност – да работи за клиентите и за общността. В техния шоурум или по телефона ще получиш качествена консултация за това как лесно и изгодно да оборудваш твоето студио. Разбери повече на dinafos.bg Използвай промокод SUPERHUMAN21, за да получиш свръхчовешка отстъпка. Робърт, благодаря, че си тук. Да, благодаря, че си ме имаме. Съм тръпвам. It is interesting uh, to have uh, an author of um, a best-selling book here in Bulgaria. So I uh, jumped in on the opportunity to have you on the podcast for a bit shorter than my usual three hour, four hour uh, marathons. But uh, you're here and I'll be very happy uh, to have this conversation with you. So, the queen. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I love the trip so far. Like, uh, it, I've been really busy. Uh, but uh, I'm glad we also have some in-person meetups. We had a freelance meetup uh, on Monday. Uh, yesterday I've, I've been a guest on Women's Entrepreneurs Night and so on. So it was it has been pretty intense. That's great. Um, by the way, you probably haven't heard that uh, Locus, uh, your publishers here in Bulgaria, are uh, big friends of mine. And we are um, constantly doing things on the book fairs, etc., etc., together. And I really love the books that they choose. And uh, Kremena, the founder of uh, Locus Publishing, he, she was telling me about your book last year. She was like, you need to read it. You need to read it. And now um, I'm currently uh, catching up because I didn't uh, um, have enough time to read as much as I wanted to. I'm currently halfway through the book. And I'm like, there are so many good examples and so many things that I can pick up and introduce to what I do. Because partly the pod- making a podcast and being a solopreneur Mm-hmm. It's uh it's being a it's like a, being a freelancer. Yeah, I get job offers like yeah. shooting or like hosting or facilitating. So there are a lot of uh, useful tools uh as um uh, going through the book and also uh thank you very much for um writing it down because it's not like a 200 pages book. It's it, it's serious serious work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh this edition is a little bit shorter. The original Czech edition was even longer. It was like 760 pages. But uh, then uh, we decided when we went international with the book, we decided that we need to uh, edit some parts out. Mm. And uh, because otherwise it would be really hard to place it on an international, you know, book market. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah. To read a book that's more than 800 pages long. Well, uh, it is in Bulgarian. Uh, Well, the story is like uh, is really well. I'm not a writer by profession, you know, so uh, mm. it it has been quite a ride, and I've been extremely lucky uh, for publishers, you know, like uh, here in uh, Bulgaria, Kremena is a fantastic personality. She's quite a person, uh, to be honest, and uh, the same with Harper Collins, uh, the international edition. The same with uh, my original Czech publishers. Uh, they are also they are very niche, you know. They only mm. publish. Uh, mm, a dozen of books uh, a year but each of them is like very carefully selected and they've been personally involved as publishers you know working with me so uh, it's I'm quite uncommon yeah this is the freelance uh, way uh, the version in English and there is an um, uh, there are a few words from Stephen Pressfield yeah uh, recently I went through uh, the war of art uh, oh, which was book. very inspiring and yeah. I need to get back to it Probably some books need more than one read, so you can uh, perceive like the message in a in in a, in a in a in a big way. Um, listening through your book, I've heard a lot of the books that have been mentioned on the podcast that I'm uh, particularly big fan of. Uh, for example, um, 
deep work, digital minimalism, everything from Cal Newport. Uh, I've heard that you're referring to, of course, Total Recall by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, many and different things that you're mentioning here and there. I'm like, yeah, I've read this one. Oh, yeah, I've read this one. So um, it's uh, it will be interesting for you to share your journey that led you into freelancing and then into writing the book. So let's start off at the beginning. So tell me a bit more about your education. There's a very interesting story inside the book about your parents making a bakery and your yeah. first uh, uh, touches uh, to this entrepreneurial. Uh, like in Bulgaria, people were like, oh, having your own business, this means like going through coffees, restaurants, nice venues, good cars, expensive apartments. But it's actually <laughs> a not nine to five, but it's like 24-7 job. Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, my well, we are both from a post uh, communist communism countries. countries. So uh, you know, uh, my family uh, came uh, to the Czech part of Czechoslovakia from Slovakia. So they were sort of immigrants. You know, when I was two, uh, there was this uh, apartment crisis in the city because it was a booming city. It was an industrial city. I was born in Ostrava. Ostrava, okay, and. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there were no apartments basically, so we lived like uh, a dozen people in a two two room apartment for uh, some time. I mm -hmm. think like two years, and uh, then my uh, granddad died. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, it sort of you know pushed the family mm -hmm. uh, to gather their resources to be more you know active in you know finding some extra money, whatever. And my parents uh, were active enough to save, uh, to do, to have some savings. And when there was the Belvedere Revolution, uh, they immediately uh, thought about starting a business. So mm -hmm. they had this plan. They started a bakery, which was like, uh, this is a really demanding business. You know, like you need a lot of capital. You need to rent a space, you know. But they were not really experienced. Nobody was experienced in running a business, you know, in a communist country. So they were right? brave. They were bold, I would say. Okay. They were bold and uh, they had partners. So they, they shared their risk with and capital with uh, another couple. And uh, since this was such an intense, uh, you know, way of doing business, uh, there was no way back. Once they mm -hmm. bought the ovens, uh, you know, uh, hired people, they actually had to go through the whole process uh, in order to succeed. And the result was that uh, we almost haven't seen them uh, uh, at home with my with my brother. They were constantly working. And I and I sort of, you know, when I saw it, when I realized that this is this uh, this actually is running a business, I sort of promised to myself that I will never ever be an entrepreneur, that I will never ever do a business like them because uh, it just didn't make sense to earn a living by such an intense labor, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, little did I know then about freelancing. You know, I was studying a business school, which was also highly company oriented. So it also, it, it only strengthened my uh, bias against business so to say. And then <clears throat> when I finished, uh, actually my journey, uh, I really loved hitchhiking, you know, like mm -hmm. it was a big thing then. Uh, people were quite poor, uh, especially young people like me. And I was never like financially supported by my parents in any way. Like th they really brought me up as a sort of, uh, you know, self-sustainable individual. And so I was hitchhiking all the time. It was my hobby. You know, I, I came back from school. I went for hitchhiking for a couple of hours. Then I came back home. That that was my regular routine, like when I was at high school. And then I sort of hitchhiked with a friend to Spain. We wanted to do some seasonal labor. Uh, but we came after the season, <laughs> which we didn't know where exactly it ends. And I was looking for work. And uh, I sort of uh, bumped into a, a company that was looking for an IT guy. And I was coding since I was a kid, like uh, I was um, excited about all these, you know, 8-bit computers. So I had my Commodore, then I had my PC, whatever, and I was coding all the time. And I realized, well, I can do this job. I mean, like, come on. So I made a contract to 
uh, to be a lead and only programmer on a really big project. It was a web portal, but it was late 1990s. So it was like the early era of the internet. The uh, we were all very excited about, you know, being part of this movement. It mm -hmm. was like so intense and it was changing the world in a way. So I totally immersed myself uh, in the gig. You know, I was working seven days a week. Uh, my own boss urged me not to go there on Sunday. Come on, guy, you have to have some free time. I didn't care. I was just, I was just totally into it. So I sort of did this project mm -hmm. and after two years, I totally burned out, of course. I was 22 and I was like burned out completely. And I decided, well, I need to take ta some time off from IT stuff. You know, I was sitting two years in front of computer. The project was done basically like a phase of it. And then I said, well, I will probably take a year off working at a winery because as I was hitchhiking to Spain, there and back, you know, I was always going through France and we had this rare opportunities to taste some wine, to, to see the, you know, wine culture. So I was, well, this is something I would like to try. And I was really young, you know, 22. So I thought, well, why not? I will learn to make a wine, to, to, to do wine. So I found um, like a manual labor job uh, at a winery school near Vienna. And I worked there for um, a year, basically, like uh, nine or 10 months. And then I decided that I actually like uh, doing this uh, freelance work, this independent thing, but I would prefer to work for multiple clients. So mm. that was my big moment. I realized that I suddenly realized that I can imagine, you know, doing a business on my own, that it's feasible, that I had one client that I can go on uh, with. Uh, he was really excited about, about my work. As I said, I was like the, the lead programmer there and I didn't give up on him. Mm -hmm. You know, so we sort of went back to a project, but I, but I already stated that I would like to go more easy on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> not to burn out again, you know, in a couple of So uh, you went back to Spain? Yeah, yeah. I to went your pre previous a couple employee. of times. I lived in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. uh, it was beautiful. Which year was that? Uh, I'm sorry? Which year was that? Uh, I started like uh, in 1998 there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then in the second phase, like it was in early 2000s, I worked in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the city is mm. crazy. Never it's, been to Barcelona, but uh, uh, Barcelona is probably uh, having uh, uh, a quote for our Christus Tuchkov, which was uh, one of the best Barcelona players. And uh, yeah. like the people in uh, Barcelona love him. The yeah, that the city Catalan is people. one and only. It's mm. like uh, it was really great. You you go to bars mm -hmm. uh, every night where Dali was going before you, or Picasso, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, or Hemingway, you know. So uh, the cultural spirit of the city is incredible, mm -hmm. undescribable. Basically, something like Paris, perhaps, or mm. other places. But I have this personal relationship with Barcelona, mm -hmm. and of course now it's much more. Uh, full of tourists and mm. uh, the vibe has changed a little bit but uh, in my memory it's still a city of art so you went to spain with uh, knowing only english absolutely not i knew <laughs> no 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 sorry spanish knowing no spanish english mm. of course i i knew english but they my 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 client that he didn't know almost any english so <laughs> we sort of communicated through <laughs> examples you know uh f well the project started uh in a way that we translated um an expert website for french uh, professionals mm -hmm. he had a friend in france mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so he translated the french text to spanish and i then i sort of you know figured out how to put it on a like a, in a different form i was doing the it work and he was doing the translation okay. and you know all the expert stuff we communicated pretty well i believe he was a very temperamental person uh <laughs> He, he was a marquee guy and he was okay. uh, working with, um, uh, the company was actually working with uh, a heat and ventilation okay. system. So I was running the IT division, but they were doing also all these installations, you know. And, you know, in that era, you know, there was a lot, lot of like uh, shady, uh, no, gray area in business in Barcelona. For example, he told me one day, mm -hmm. 
that they have a client, uh, a com- sort of company that employs like 200 workers, but it's not a registered company. They were just, you know, running the operation as a sort of like yeah. street business, you know. Yeah. It wouldn't be possible these days. Money in envelopes. I'm sorry? Money in envelopes. I don't know. I don't know any details. <laughs> and he, he sort of la- laughed about it. I mean, like they were working for all kinds of stuff, but this was a really serious business yeah. I was working for. Yeah. But, the you know, the overall uh, business environment was... Uh, more you know informal than it is these days probably so it's like 25 years ago right so this uh snapped it uh yeah your perception about having your own business uh, this this particular experience um <clears throat> how did it go from then on yeah um uh i sort of uh well i sort of uh did websites for more people for small mm-hmm. companies uh, my parents and so on uh so that was that was quite okay but two important things happened at the time i believe first of all uh, other friends who were freelancing at the time saw that i was sort of freelancing internationally that i'm pretty doing well so they started asking me questions so i started doing like one-on-one consulting sessions mm-hmm. just helping them out um i also started to i also started to do some business consulting for companies mm-hmm. because uh, uh since i was working in an industry that was like nascent uh this web uh development uh like portals and like big sites you know um some companies realize that i have know-how you know well technical but also business know-how how to create these projects and they approached me you know to help them uh to do the online switch so i s- also started to do um uh, business consulting that went back to my studies i was originally studying business so it was quite familiar uh, to me the the topic and i, I started oriented this way a, a bit more and I got interested in supporting freelancers. You know, I really am quite extroverted and I really like being around people, you know, talking to a lot of people. And uh, uh, I realized that some of my friends who are more introverted and a little bit shy about, you know, presenting themselves have issues, you know, finding new clients. So I sort of started small websites that presented their work uh, it was really very successful. They were constantly getting leads uh, from clients. And they were sort of like, uh, hey, add this friend of mine or that one, you know. But the websites were really small. They were not designed to be really large, you know. But then in 2004, I went to Mexico. Uh, I loved uh, Spanish and Hispan culture at the time. So Mexico was like really like, it was the go-to country, you know, like, I was so excited about being there. I spent a quarter a year there. Uh, lots of travels, lots of exploration, and lots of uh, long bus journeys. And on these bus journeys, there were no mo- mobiles at the time. Uh, I had a couple of books, but I read them like the day one, you know. So I was sort of, you know, like looking out of the window thinking. And I realized, hey, come on, I can probably turn these small websites into something larger, into a web, sort of web portal. And when I came back, I sort of like finished every, um, some client projects and started developing a large website for freelancers. And that became eventually, after a couple of years, uh, the largest check uh, at first the only one but uh eventually a really large uh website and community for freelancers so we currently support over a quarter million people who follow us who listen to podcasts mm-hmm. who read the newsletter and so on and it started really small it was a one-man show at the beginning now we are like a dozen people it's a sm- it's still a small team but uh, we are trying to make uh, as big impact as we can so there was 2005 and from there mm-hmm. on i sort of started uh inventing ways how to support freelancers as as entrepreneurs mm-hmm. because uh i think of freelancing as a as of business you know the, the only problem is that it's a different way of doing business than running a company like my parents did or then like uh, starting a startup and then having some exit strategy whatever you don't have a exit strategy <laughs> as a freelancer right like no you are you are there out for yourself 
And at, at what time did the idea for the book came to life? How did it arrive? Because uh, I can imagine that you working hands-on and uh, uh, next to all these freelancers, all these people that you talk to and they give you feedback and they give you ideas and they uh, share their own problems and stories. So you um, accumulated all of this. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <clears throat> well, as you... As you have mentioned, uh, I'm quite a reader. So uh, I read a lot, perhaps 50 books a year mm -hmm. on average. Um, and uh, I have this admiration for people who write books. You know, it's, uh, it's, I, I always wanted to be a writer or something like that. Uh, I had various creative ambitions when I, when I was a teenager, when I was a kid. But it was always uh, something I would aspire to one day. Uh, and, well, of course, the idea of writing a book occurred to me. Uh, I wasn't that ambitious to write it at first because I was sort of waiting if somebody will publish uh, such a book in Czech. It didn't happen, and I probably know why these days because most of these books are uh, written originally in the States. And the states uh, are quite different in freelancing. Mm -hmm. Freelancers have different mindset, different attitudes. They face much graver risks in terms of, you know, not having uh, health insurance, for example. Uh, they may also be more easily sued if they, you know, miss something. So these books for American freelancers that are quite specific to the, you know, economy. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that is why my most publishers sort of, you know, like opted not to publish them because mm -hmm. it would need uh, some sort of transposition of the know-how, whatever. Uh, so then I realized, you know, after training freelancers and working with the community after a few years, that probably it has to me be me, right? Because mm -hmm. I was writing blog articles. I was writing a lot, but not books. Uh, and then I sort of like failed two times because I actually didn't know how to write a book. I mean, like... How can a male man fail with his book? Well, you start and you and realize you that you uh, that you don't know how long it should be, what should be the structure. You don't have the means how to produce it, you know? Uh, I wanted to write a great <laughs> book, you know? So I'm always very ambitious in what I do. So I didn't want to write just any, you know, collection of, uh, you know, of random ideas. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I really wanted to do something complex, but I didn't know how to approach it. I know it sounds sort of uh, ridiculous, you know, but it, it is, I faced the wall of uh, um, a sort of wheel, wheel of ignorance. I just didn't know how to do it. And uh, then two things happened. First of all, I read The War of Art uh, mm -hmm. by Stephen Pressfield. That became really a pivotal moment in my artist or creative journey, I would say, because I realized that uh, for myself, at least, mm -hmm. uh, the resistance is a real thing. That there is this inner force, you know, no matter how you call it, that sort of sabotages, you know, your higher ambitions to achieve by inventing reasons why you should do something you know less demanding you know more more uh pleasant i would say so uh, procrastinate in other words in a way in a way you mm. know like uh it's it, it, well pressfield has a great uh insight there that procrastination is only one of the hundreds of faces that the resistance can take. Yeah. You know, because for some people, it's not procrastination. It would be, for example, a perfectionism. So they would work on a thing forever, never it. being perfect enough, and they would work their ass off, you know, mm -hmm. trying to produce the thing yeah. while actually being... Uh, the victim of the resistance, mm -hmm. which is crazy. I mean, like, I highly recommend not only this book. He read, uh, he wrote a, a whole series of, like, short books for creators. Uh, I would recommend it to any artist or creator. Just, uh, you know, uh, there is this turning pro about professionalism. There is this, uh, I'll love the title, nobody wants to read your 
beep shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there is his uh, you know memoir, government cheese, his personal story, how he became uh, a writer. It took him 30 years to publish the first best-selling book. Yeah. So he was like, well, this guy is my hero, you know, and I'm so proud that he wrote a blurb for my book. Like, uh, how did you manage to get to him? Uh, because my publishers, my Czech publishers, uh, uh, published uh, his book War of Art based on my recommendation. Oh, so wow. they get got in touch with him, and I sort of, you know, started a conversation when, with him, and he's really. The nicest person you can imagine. Oh wow! Like I, I, I totally adore, a, adore it's him. It's a huge book, and uh, these people are very busy. So yeah, yeah. And look, uh, the more I know about the guy, the more I admire him because, like, uh, the the story he describes in Government Cheese, my story is nothing against that. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, he uh, was working as a copywriter when he was like twenty, something mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. I was, perhaps, and then he decided that he will write a big novel novel Mm -hmm. right yeah and he sort of like went all in he failed his marriage failed yeah he was so uh you know humbled by the experience that he became a sort of like homeless person he was sleeping in a van for a decade perhaps working on some you know seasonal labor stuff he was not writing at all he was going through this dark period of his life where nothing actually made sense and then he sort of, you know, decided step by step to go back to writing because it was actually the only thing that made him cling back to life. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it, it was the only thing that actually made him hold on to his own life. Mm-hmm. And he sort of went to Hollywood. He started writing scripts. He was like a junior writer. So everybody was sort of mocking a floor with him at first, you know, so he had to learn the trade and had to learn the uh, the principles of a good script, of a good story, you know. Uh, then uh, he went back to writing novels and then uh, he was still being rejected. Like he sort of like went through the spirit for 30 years. Like he published the first a best-selling book, The Legend of Beggar Wands, when yeah. he was like 50 plus, 54 something. So it took him like... 30 or more years and it was instant bestseller and Robert Redford bought uh the rights to uh, to to make a movie of it mm. and the second bo- book after that was Gates of Fire about the uh, Battle of Thermopyl uh mm. about the Greek uh, army history yeah. and that book also is like it's one of the best novels ever I highly recommend it so yeah he's like he's an incredible guy I love the story well, and going back to my uh, to my uh, to my own story. Yeah, but uh, this is. Uh, 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 just, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll pause here. Sorry, you are sharing something about someone that inspired you. Yeah, this is the sole purpose of my podcast. This is the purpose of people sharing their context, how we got to our success, <clears throat> and this is what we suffered through to get there, uh, because. From the per uh, from the point of view of a student or a high school uh, student or a student in university, you're thinking that success is a given, or uh, it's like uh, something like a talent, or success is because someone else gave it to you. Therefore, back in the days when I started, I was like, but I know all these great people that I talk to on a weekly or daily basis, that they have these hard stories about uh, being broke, uh, coming back uh, from uh, quitting uh, uh, university and then being rejected by your parents for years because they paid your education and uh, they were so sad that you quit without like even talking to them uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you, like, you continue through this and then you form your own version of success. So the Superhuman Podcast is about finding your own way towards what you define as success for you and being inspired by others, just like Roger Bannister's story. Okay, this is possible. Robert did it. Uh, whoever uh, was on the podcast did it. So I, I've been dreaming uh, to uh, about creating uh, spacecraft. There is a Bulgarian entrepreneur called Raichu Rachev. He created Endurosat. Endurosat is a nano satellite company, which is amazing. It has more than 100 people working in Sofia. Uh, they sent five nano satellites 
uh, during the latest mission of SpaceX on SpaceX rockets. So he his dream was to make such kind of um, devices when he was a kid, and then he followed his dream and got rejected hundreds of times for inv- for investments by angel investors by venture funds. Everyone was laughing at him, and now everyone wants to be like him. Yeah. So this is why I just want to uh, uh, put some emphasis on, on, on Stephen. And I, I, I like the war of art. Maybe I will need to go back to it and I'll, I'll share a story, an idea that I have in my own head with you in a second. But because one of our sponsors is a software company that uh, basically um, love reading people there, love reading books and they make recommendations for us. Uh, what wha- what kind of recommendations for books apart from Stephen Pressfield's books would you make uh, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and uh, freelancing and business success? Of course, the freelance way too. Well, um, just a, a list with three to, f- to five because I know you can share a lot of books. Yeah, uh, well, with freelancing, uh, it's uh, my, my uh, recommendation would be probably to read uh, about specifics. So, mm. uh, for example, it's very important uh, to be better, to get better at negotiations. Mm-hmm. I believe that this is really highly under- underestimated skill in a way. Uh, <clears throat> so, and actually, this is probably the only area in of freelancing where I would not only recommend to read books but that where I would recommend to le- to read a couple of them because uh, you know like uh, learning to negotiate by trial and error is quite costly because every time you you know make uh, close a bad deal whatever it costs you dearly it may cost you dearly mm-hmm. so uh, that would be the first area where I was f- where I would focus on uh, there is this uh, classic book uh, called Getting to Yes. Okay, uh, I know it. It's, it's by Fisher and Uri. Uh, it's an old one, uh, but it's still, I believe, the basis of so-called uh, consultative uh, negotiations, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because there are different schools of negotiating, you mm-hmm. know, and some of them are in general, in my opinion, are not really suitable for freelancers. Mm -hmm. They are more for power players, you know? Yeah, like Uh, never split the difference. Yeah, like this one. (laughs) It's like, it's a nice, It's there are nice stories, but, you know, the guy is was negotiating with the SWAT team by his uh, around his back, you know. So this is some something it's different, different leverage. Yeah, it's a different leverage. As freelancers, we don't have that leverage, and we have to use different, mm-hmm. more soft skills to negotiate. Mm-hmm. So that that book is actually the essence of how to how to think about negotiating when you don't have any great mm-hmm. leverage. Uh, there is also a great. Uh, uh, audio program uh you, you probably know great courses right uh so uh there is this great uh, courses uh, lecture series called the art of negotiating the best deal it's narrated and presented by Seth Friedman he's a specialist in in negotiations basically and what i liked about his take is that he has chapters about i don't know negotiating on salaries negotiating with kids uh you're a new you're a new dad right like so uh you may find it helpful uh negotiating uh uh, rent and so on so he's really very practical and he's not really you know like uh overplaying his hand i mm-hmm. would say like he's really realistic and i really loved his approach i highly recommend this this book well um, going going on with uh, the recommendations uh, uh, i would definitely recommend reading about uh, well this will sound silly but uh, uh i would definitely recommend reading as much as possible about longevity and about you know supporting uh wealth uh, uh, health sorry uh because health is, health is wealth of course <laughs> uh because for us as freelancers you know having fragile health 
is a really highly risky situation. Mm -hmm. You know, like that would basically disable you to do your job. And that is also why mm -hmm. as I'm having all these interactions with this community, I see that freelancers are way, way, way more likely to be interested about healthy lifestyle than the general population because they have this... Uh, they have this uh, realization that if they are not healthy and, you know, uh, yeah. if they don't have the energy that the client expects, basically, uh, it would be very hard to do their job. You, you, know? don't, so, you don't have the uh, colleagues to support you when you're sick. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I would recommend a couple of books. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, diet, uh, I would recommend reading Max Lugavier's book, uh, Genius Foods, mm -hmm. uh, because it's about uh, science and about diet that supports uh, brain health. Mm -hmm. And since most freelancers are actually knowledge workers, we work with our brains, brains uh, it's super important, in my opinion, to mm -hmm. know something about the chemistry uh, that supports good brain health. Uh, especially for the long term, mm -hmm. because he's presenting in the book not only some dietary recommendations, but also the strategies how to preserve your brain in a top shape uh, mm -hmm. for a for a lifetime, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are two very important books. Uh, you, you surely know about them. Uh, uh, first, this uh, uh, health span lifespan or life lifespan, lifespan by by david sinclair yeah no. uh he's a famous uh, longevity scientist and then there is this new book uh by, by peter atia uh outlive which is i would say like the practical side of uh david sinclair's work mm. so he's recommending uh, what tests to take uh what prevention measures uh how to take care of emotional health it's really complex and it's uh strongly evidence-based i i love evidence-based literature um uh well and if you want the third recommendation that would probably be something in the in the finance or wealth management style management or sales what's uh, more important to get more money in or to manage your money better well sales uh would be fine but uh as freelancers, we sell differently than companies. Yeah. So there are precious few books that would be applicable <laughs> to freelancers. You know, it's like, uh, uh, I don't have any, you know, like a recommendation on sales for freelancers, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, most books there are really meant for a slightly different way of doing business. But in terms of investments, for example, I would recommend... Uh, uh, Where, if you uh, remember I, the author, I might help. Yeah, uh, John C. Bogle is the author. He's the inventor of uh, of uh, uh, index funds. But mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the title. It's the uh, yeah, the little book of common sense investing, uh, and it's the tenth anniversary edition. It's basically his concluding book on the subject. Uh, it was published when he was like eighty, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the 10th anniversary edition was published, you know, a, a bit later. It also included notes about ETFs, about how to mm -hmm. sort of, you know, uh, take part of your uh, savings. You know, why is it, mm -hmm. why does it make sense to uh, to use index funds rather than do uh, stock picking, which many people confidently do until, until they find that they really don't have time to study all these companies and to analyze the markets the way professionals do. So that is a really helpful book, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I'm quite invested in stocks, uh, but I, you know, I'm sort of careful investor. And I think this book sort of... Uh, puts all the important arguments in mm -hmm. one place so that people can make a uh, more informed and rational uh, decision on this. Yeah, yeah. thanks for the great uh, book recommendations. Uh, I would like to thank our sponsors from Storpo Storage. They are Bulgarian-made software for uh, storage, uh, distributed storage of uh, uh, data in cloud environment. And their uh, co-founder, Bujan, was on the podcast in episode 298, but it was only in Bulgarian, unfortunately. 
Um, from on, on the first type of uh, recomm- recommendation that you did about negotiation, uh, I, I told you that he, having a podcast and making a podcast is more or less being a freelancer because uh, it's a different and unpaved way towards monetization and business models. Mm-hmm. It needs to fit your way of um, uh, the way that you see the world, your values and everything. So um, the the one uh, like thing that allowed me to create a business model that's sustainable here in uh, probably it took me around three years mm-hmm. was um, the fourth habit of the seven habits of the Stephen Covey, which is always think win-win. Mm-hmm. So I created and I always approach negotiation in a way I don't want to take everything that's on the table. I want to take what I believe it's worth and then I in, in therefore invest in having a longer a uh, longer uh, lifetime customer value. So I work with you not only on one project, but like three, four, five in a year, two or three. So it's uh, I love that. it's something that I try to do. And I even have a TED talk about can we all win? And using this, this concept in our life, uh, I have friends of mine that help me for less of their usual payment, but I introduce them to amazing people and clients so they can have more more uh, work to be done and with the proper customers like you I said in the book uh, I, I I now remember that you we don't need to sell to anyone to everyone we yeah. need to sell to the to the proper customers to our customers like my favorite uh, Seth Godin says if you're selling to everyone you're selling to no one if you're doing it for everyone you're doing it for no one yeah uh, exactly as you said uh, you know there is a highly counterintuitive idea about negotiations, about business negotiations, mm. that you can be nice and kind and looking for win-win, yeah. you know, resolution while also being ambitious yeah. and you know aiming higher each yeah. time you do the de- do a deal. That I believe, and also assertive. Yeah, because yeah, some course, people some people are like uh, uh, perceiving this as a uh, sign of uh, weakness and yeah. they try to uh, push into you uh, which is something that uh, I I'm learning as I go through my yeah. Brazilian jiu-jitsu practice just say okay this is the boundary that you're not passing yeah. through absolutely uh I think that this is uh, something which we need to learn because this is not common in uh, everyday life, isn't mm. it? Like in everyday life, uh, the way we grow, we don't have this, you know, like double opposing uh, ideas uh, at the same time, two goals, mm-hmm. right? So we either go the soft way and we are like so-called soft negotiators, so soft negotiators, or we go the hard way and we are so-called hard negotiators. Mm. Uh, what I find really great and very inspiring about you know this uh, um, way of negotiating presented by by Fisher and Yuri in uh, getting to yes is that you basically take a position that is not completely natural at first mm-hmm. and that you uh, you know learn how to get better at being more and more ambitious in 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 uh, sort of upselling your clients or getting to new levels uh, of what you mm-hmm. do uh, without actually being a prick yeah and this is this is this is so 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 important because uh if people don't know it they they are way more likely to take the hard of or soft position there is of course uh, there is of course a third bird i would say uh my mother is one for example uh which is a sort of like a mm, <clears throat> i would call them natural negotiators mm-hmm. so these are people who are sort of very talented in a certain way of uh, negotiating uh, so, for example, my mother is very talented in one-on-one negotiating. Mm-hmm. So, whenever there was like a you know faulty product in our family, she was the one going back to shop, you know, making the return because <clears throat> she was like ninety-nine percent likely to get the refund, and uh, she learned the skill uh, 
by her nature, she's very extroverted and very communicative, uh, but also she was running shops for the company. So she was talking to shop owners all the time and she got really great at, you know, uh, influencing people mm -hmm. directly. But if I would ask her to lead, for example, M to N negotiator uh, negotiations mm -hmm. where there are like three people on one mm -hmm. side, two people on the other side, or if I would ask her to do negotiations over email, she would be really unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. You know, she that's not her thing. You know, she only developed the, her only way. You know, and I believe that uh, you know the most advanced negotiators they are really versatile in the way how can they approach the the problem they may go email they may take a phone they may go directly they may sit in person in a negotiating room whatever and they will still be very likely to uh, to go through with their mm. goals i would say so it's a it's a it's a really long journey to learn and i'm still learning along the way i would mm. say you know uh, for me the most uh interesting way is definitely the upsell i would say mm -hmm. like how to take present client relationships mm -hmm. to a new level to to a new ambition to uh to to get a larger cut from the mm -hmm. uh, from from uh, from what we create together mm -hmm. uh, while still being reasonable and appropriate in a proportion to the value that has been created this is something that i find really incredibly challenging and very interesting because this is where i you know sort of like go up with my revenues as a freelancer you know it's very easy for freelancers to plateau at a certain level i mm. i see it all the time you know people sort of like find their optimal revenue and then they plateau on it for years they don't they sort of give up on ambition to say hey i can do something more but they don't do it because it would involve you know uh, sort of risking or disrupting the current uh, client relationships you know they sort of think that uh, clients they are, are their friends and that they shouldn't you know sort of like disturb the do any waves but this is really <laughs> i find this really uh, unhelpful, you know, because mm. look, first of all, uh, any client relationship will end one day and it's better if it ends, uh, when you are trying to upsell, you know, try when you are trying to be a bit more ambitious to, to push it somewhere else where you can both, you know, create more revenue, then, uh, if it's sort of like dissolutes on a, like a long-term, you know, d dissolving relationship, mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And the second thing, you know, client is not your friend in in general. It's a, uh, it's, uh, you may have really friendly relationship with a client, but look, uh, you don't go, I, I, ne I, as a professional, I, I would never go to my client's place and complain about how, how hard my life is. You know, I would never complain about problems I have in my personal life. I'm there for a client, he pays me or she pays me, mm. so I listen to their problems, you know, and we, it may be completely amicable and friendly relationship, but it's not the same thing as if you sit with your friends it's, and they support you emotionally or whatever. So, you know. It's value-based relationship. It's like you create value for your customer and he pays you for it, for the value you create for him. It's like, it is friendly, Is like, a manner of leading a conversation. I love my exactly. my 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 partners, uh, and I have uh, something just to share about upselling to to my partners. But I I try to work with people that I find the work easier than compared to most of the people. Yeah. So I I, I pick up uh, partners that I have easy communication. I don't need to s say something and then write it down and then. Uh, the say it for the third time it's just simple simple easy um straight to the point direct communication and w what i realized it was probably last year i realized that the best way to to sell so not negotiate but to sell is to sell to the people that already have trust in you and they're happy what you have been providing them with 
because they're like, okay, if, if Georgi can do this, he's upselling with something, so he can give us even more value. It will be easier to do this than to look for new and new customers. So be brave, talk to the people that you're currently working with, ask them what you can do more for them, and then they might upsell themselves. They're like, you know, you're very good in this weird thing about this new project. That's project. a very important observation. And I, I'm uh, constantly aware that, uh, well, a great number of freelancers, even advanced one, uh, find this hard to find is hard to realize and to explore this avenue. Mm. You know, it's an issue with pricing as well mm -hmm. because uh, freelancers they are highly pro client oriented. Mm -hmm. So as you said, like we provide this also the emotional support. Like we really love our clients. I think we all have it commons. Uh, all have it common, and that in turn, you know, leads us to a certain, you know, hesitancy uh, in uh, pricing wise. So there is one thing that is really helpful, not only having this conversation, mm. I always find this conversation about pricing, about upselling very useful because mm. people otherwise may not realize that it's it's a good avenue to, to work on. But, you know, um, uh, I think that there is a useful exercise for any freelancer, you know. Uh, if you are working in an industry and freelancers work in hundreds of industries, thousands of professions, it's a really diverse universe. Um, uh, there is really great to know how big is the price scale in your profession. Because it would probably begin with something like $10 per hour, but there are probably it's highly likely people in your industry that charge a couple of thousands or a couple of well, or even more okay. uh, a couple of thousands euros or dollars per hour it's okay. not really that uncommon yeah. you know mm -hmm. in most uh, advanced knowledge work that you have some elite uh, professionals that are recognized internationally mm -hmm. and they charge this much you know and once you realize that there is the scale and that it's not a binary option that you either belong to a poor group, you know, charging 10, 20, 30 dollars per like hour. You like the fivers. Or, the you know, like to the elite group that charges, you know, like two or three thousand euros or dollars per hour of expert work, that there is this like con uh, gradual scale. Then you realize that you may do something to move along this scale. You know, this is very important. You know, people often find ways and reasons why they could not go along the mm -hmm, scale. But mm -hmm. this is an illusion. You know, you may be based in almost any Western country and still climb up, you know, by going international, by, you know, inventing something really new in your profession, by uh, actually inventing ways how we can, you know, create more value for the clients and then move along, you know, to a, to a higher grade, you know. It's not the ultimate goal, of course, but I would still find it quite disappointing how many freelancers sort of plateau on a certain quite low price level for years without actually doing anything about it. And it's actually one of the, I would say, like most important things in my book that freelancers, you know, shouldn't be too hesitant on their pricing you know we sort of tend we have this tendency to to fix our price for years you know and be sort of you know afraid to confront our clients with the possible price hike whatever we invent other ways how to how to avoid it so we overwork ourselves you know and and it has this all these chronic uh results then so Pricing is, uh, this conversation is, is, is very important, I yeah. believe. When when talking about pricing, is it a psychological issue or is like, um, because it, uh, in my personal experience, there are two things that prevented me from, I need to share a story. Uh, probably three years ago, three years ago, two and a half years ago at least, I had a call from a very large Bulgarian bank about making an online um, 
online podcast for them, just for sure. the people. It was on longevity, by the way. It was like mm-hmm. uh, being healthy, and I invited a person that's, that's been great. on my podcast and yeah. an expert. And um, I was uh, I was thinking how much should I charge them with? It was, they they wanted something like an hour and a half, and I was thinking about I don't know, 250, 300 euro. And I called a friend of mine that usually does identical trainings, like events with such clients. And he said, why? That's just not enough. It's You deserve more. And I'm like, yeah, but he was like, yeah, charge them 1,000 euro. And I'm thinking, no, 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 I won't charge them 1,000 euro. <laughs> then I go to my uh, I fiance <laughs> and, I, I, and I tell her, and he's selling basically four times more. And I go to my fiance and say, listen, I was thinking about this, but I don't think I can ask them for 1,000 euro for, for the event. <laughs> and she's like, why? But if you don't ask them, you you always stuck your plateau on this price and you always say this price. You won't learn anything new if you're not, if you don't try something new. Like, yeah. And then I talked to my uh, psychotherapist. I do this for, I've been visiting him for probably around three and three years or four. And he's asking me, okay, wh- what do you imagine to happen if you say 1,000 euro to the person that's expecting your offer? Like send them an email and say, and then I was like, yeah, they will probably think that I'm uh, uh, greedy. And he's asking me this question. How can someone put you like a moral label? Like, how can you put on yourself a moral label from someone that you don't know? Like, can you imagine what you happen? Try to put yourself in his shoes or her shoes and read the email and what would you do? And I imagine being this lady in an office, in a like in a bank, uh, receiving an email about like me saying, "Hey, I would love to do this event. I will invite this guest, and it will be like one thousand euro." And she's like, "Ah, oh, this is just a bit of, of, above our budget." And I'm like, "Oh my god, it's that simple." I mean, if they say it's too much, they'll just say it's above our budget. Can we do something? One year later, I have a invitation from the same customer to uh, do a in person events, and I'm thinking okay how much should i say i would say uh it it was probably uh, an hour hour and a half but in person it's not that much of my thing i was like okay i'm going to offer them uh, 750 euro for one event for like two hours just to be there and uh, to share a story inspiring it was like short keynote and i i send the email and they and then I receive an email back. Yeah, this is a bit above above our budget. I'm like, okay, I make like twenty five percent discount, something like this, thirty percent discount. I do like six hundred euro instead of seven fifty. And she's like, yeah, that's perfect, perfect. Let's do it. And one week before the event, she calls and says, listen, we need to do a second event. I'm like, yeah, no worries. A same price. She was like, yeah. So instead of getting seven fifty, I got. Uh, uh, 1,200 because I basically was able to step down to match something that they wanted me to, not to match my internal, uh, uh, like, uh, belief, limiting belief. Yeah. So we are, that's why I'm asking, we are way too much in our, into our own hand, h- heads. Mm-hmm. And external viewpoint, like therapists, helps um, a lot. Uh, that's a great story because it's so practical. It's uh, it show it shows exactly how it is in life. Mm. Uh, I have a couple of notes to that. Uh, mm. First of all, of course, that pricing is heavily based in our psychology, and I would say if you are if you are about to get, uh, I, I don't mean you, but in general, mm-hmm. if you are about to get uh, better in pricing, you know, the single most important rule is to do the pricing. I mean, like, play with the price so that you know exactly what your price elasticity and even more importantly, mm-hmm. what your pricing power is. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this uh, concept uh popularized by by Warren Buffett uh, called pricing power. Mm-hmm. 
uh, which means, in essence, what is your capacity to raise price without uh, losing your clients for for the competition? You know, so mm. if you have a great pricing power, it means that you may rise raise I don't know like one hundred percent, for example, without actually losing any clients. If you have a low mm -hmm. pricing power, it means that. Uh, as Warren Buffett says, you you need to have a prayer session every time you raise your price by 10% or something like that, you know? <laughs> and he, he's also famous for uh, for saying that Apple is a fantastic company because they may raise the price any way they like and people still buy their products, by the way. it's I, I love that quote because uh, it's, it's true. And uh, so we also have this pricing power mm -hmm. as freelancers. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if people have a fixed price for ages, they don't they don't have a clue what their real pricing power is. Mm -hmm. You only find out like what's your what's the like a top price you may yeah. be asking by actually playing alternating, around alternating, playing, playing the around price and seeing yeah. how people react uh, mm -hmm. to your you know no, raising it. demands mm -hmm. basically. And there is another very important concept in uh, in freelance pricing, which I would say is uh, uh, I would call it uh, validating a mm -hmm. price. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, with this case, you know, you only got the first negotiation for thousand euro, then for seven hundred. These are only these are only two data points. Yeah. So this is like highly unreliable. Yeah. It's only one client. So. It doesn't actually tell you what your real pricing power is because this client may be uh, really low on budget or really conservative in willing to. They may they may have a department, you know, that tells them like how many mm -hmm. can they pay. So your goal in general is to get as much of these data points, you know, as possible, and then you see. Very important thing that if you are, for example, constantly asking, you know. Uh, I don't know, 1,500 euros for a talk and you are con constantly getting uh, accepted, then you know this is validated level of my pricing and I'm completely confident without actually feeling greedy as whatever because this is, you know, where this comes from, like they will think I'm uh, greedy. I mean, like, this comes from uncertainty yeah. because if you would be selling at this price normally and you would have validated that price, you would know that it's not a greedy price, that it's a price that customers mm -hmm. are willing to mm -hmm. pay specifically for you and mm -hmm. your service. Mm -hmm. So my general you know, observation here would be that freelancers, if they don't play with the price, if they don't touch their price offer often, they may be actually leaving uh, money lying on the street mm -hmm without realizing that their pricing power would allow them to double or triple their rate with, a, with some effort, of course, because mm -hmm. you need to sort of, you know, like um, sort of exchange some clients for new ones, possibly, you know, like if you are charging more, you sort of attract people who seek from, seek a high quality in mm -hmm. service, whatever. But, uh, you know, this is very important. Uh, Actually, if you don't touch your price often, you live in an uncertain pricing uh, superposition. You don't know what the what the real possibility is. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm currently charging uh, for like one hour of work something like twelve hundred euros. Yeah. For and, consultancy. Yeah, for consultancy and. One of the important moments for me to to go on this price, I I I, uh, I changed it after my book went out and I got really a lot of inquiries, was that I f uh, find out found it out by talking to industry colleagues who are well, more senior than I am that there are people in our industry who charge five thousand euros per hour, three thousand euros per hour. They work in London, whatever, and. It's common, like if you find clients for this price, you know, and you sell your time at this level, who can tell that you are greedy or whatever? I mean, like yeah. the client wants you, he's willing to pay or she's willing to pay. And that's about it. I mean, like- uh, It's a free market. Yeah, so it's a free market. You position yourself like where you want to be, but you also need to uh, keep your ego in check. 
yeah. because this is another end of the spectrum. Because spectrum is the 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 the, the whole concept of uh, looking at things uh, like a spectrum helped me so much to make better decisions. Exactly. I can lower my price for some organizations, uh, and I can have higher price for others. For example, people are calling me from high school or from some university, and they're asking me how much do you want for a lecture here? I was like, I do it for free. Yeah. Why would you do it for free? Because I do it free for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then a company approached me and said, hey, we would like you to make a motivational speech about your the podcast, everything that you've done. And I'm like, okay, and this is my price. But you are doing it for free. I'm doing it for free for students and uh, high school students. So uh, companies like yours, you have the budget and I invest this budget to create this studio and make the teamwork and spend some time here to have better mm -hmm. quality, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So... Uh, and I spend your money to get to the schools that I need to talk for free. Uh, and this is my my willingness to give something free, but get something back from yeah. the economy. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, this, it, it helps me to, 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 be, um, to be flexible. And I, am, I, I perceive myself as a freelancer. Yeah. I don't perceive my organization as a company. It is, more or less, it is a company, but I, I like it. I like this. Um, uh, per, uh, this freedom, I love freedom. My my main value is freedom, mm -hmm. and I love that you're mentioning it here. So for the freelancer to 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 freelance around to do whatever wherever he want to. Yeah. So I'm um, it, it our conversation just grows deeper and deeper, and I need I need to go through something uh, with you because you um uh you mentioned that. Um, the pricing power is something important. Yeah, Warren Buffett is a, a great tool uh, to get some information about I'm, my pricing. The book that I would like to refer to is called Monetizing Innovation, which is a great book that uh, focuses on uh, on features and to build products around the features, not the pricing around the product. Uh, it's, it's something uh, that inspired me a lot. Uh, and then I have another question from another partner about the podcast that you listen to. Can you recommend something? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm a big fan of podcasting. Uh, but I still dedicate only like a small fraction of my listening mm. time to it. Uh, I'm a big fan of Audible. Yeah. So I listen to English audiobooks. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, so this this has a priority in a, in a way. Uh, I just finished uh, listening to Walter Isaacson Elon Musk book. Oh, okay. I was, well, I was stunned. Okay. Uh, that was something because I never, I was never interested in Elon Musk uh, too much. He's controversial. Uh, no, I I don't consider him controversial. It's just uh, I'm not too much in cars or rockets. So it was sort of like flying under my radar. Of but you're too much into PayPal because freelancers are like this whole pay payment system was supported so much yeah, by PayPal. And yeah, he's PayPal course. mafia, Elon. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, but uh, the, the way Isaacson wrote the book, it actually floored me. I mean, he's a really great writer. It was the first book I, I read from him. That was something. He's the best biographist in the, in the states, I believe. Yeah, uh, since I was so disappointed with the uh, latest Michael Lewis uh, book about Sam Bankman Fried and FTX okay. downfall, uh, <laughs> I believe so because uh, formally I would say that Michael Lewis is the best. Okay, he's like uh, he was my really like top uh, favorite. Uh, if you read Flash Boys or. Mm something like that or boomerang like he's a really i i believe he's really like a top non-fiction writer out there in, in states currently but uh the bankman fried book was really like he was sort of apologetic about the guy and i and i really hated it because yeah. i think he's a fraud but uh i'll, uh, I'll I, recommend mark manson uh, because i believe he is the best non-fiction writer currently in the states all right thank you have you read the Will's biography? No. Will Smith? No, no, no. Go ahead. No, I, And I then didn't. you can go through the subtle art of not giving a fuck. But I'm grateful for the recommendation because yeah. it's so hard to 
find new authors. Once I know that the author is good, of course, he that's is, a different story. I believe that he's amazing, but this is my personal view. Um, I don't, but I also read uh, fiction, of yeah. course, uh, a lot. But going back to your podcast, yeah. uh, mm, I think I won't surprise you uh, with with my with my tips. Uh, uh, my first... Uh, and highest recommendation would probably go to Huberman Lab. Mm -hmm. Andrew Huberman. Yeah. He's basically uh doing like evidence based popular science podcast about health. So he's really my favorite podcaster uh at the time. Then I listened to uh I, I was listening to Eric Weinstein's The Portal when he was doing it. He mm -hmm. stopped. So like he's crazy he's crazy but uh i like his craziness mm, uh i also listen to breaking news mm -hmm. you know what it is no uh it's the biggest uh news podcast in the states currently so there are two guys who sort of you know started to do news mm -hmm. and uh I think they are a huge thing. They are, they are definitely something to something worthwhile to listen to. Uh, they position themselves as being non-partisan, so they are mm. not left-leaning nor right-leaning. Mm -hmm. uh, they are sort of uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, they try to cover everything that is going on in the world. And what I like about the podcast is that it presents purely. And only the American perspective. You yeah, know, yeah. Like uh, I read enough European media. Uh, I like. I don't know. I, I'm. I really love the Economist, uh, mm. Financial Times, whatever, whatever, Politico. But uh, you know, this is all like the, uh, especially the Economist is like really European view, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, uh, the, of course, the Czech media, of course, but these are unknown outside of the country but uh the breaking news is like you know enable me enable enabling me uh to see the american perspective which mm -hmm. sometimes makes me angry <laughs> uh because you know we are so used to our you know position on the war in ukraine that mm -hmm. we 100 percent support you know mm -hmm. the struggle and then you sort of listen to americans they are sort of you know worry about you know things and uh they try to dispute you know things so uh, i find it i find it uh, helpful to to be confronted with uh, intelligent people who have different ideas and who mm. are not any extremists you know like yeah. they, they are just having mm. intelligent intelligent discussions because it presents it sort of widens mm. uh my understanding that mm. people in the states may have completely different you know points of view and and this is helpful and um sometimes i listen to joe rogan mm -hmm. um uh, especially when he has a uh, probably only when he has a guest that i'm interested in uh uh we have podcasts as well and he i find him i find him uh also crazy like he's really like uh for conspirations and so on but uh he trusts uh, he believes in ufos and stuff i, I would <laughs> never uh consider this to be really realistic but i find him interesting in uh, the way he conducts his podcast you know like uh because we also have one and i and i believe that uh, he made me way less formal Mm. Uh, because, you know, there are these uh, scenes, for example, that he's interviewing someone and then there is someone banging loud something back in the studio, right? And he said, like, come on, guys, we are recording her interview for 10 million people. Can you stop doing that? <laughs> and and he leaves that in the show. And then, then mm. I realized, like, come on, like, he, he could have cut it out. And he leaves it there because it's authentic. Uh, it's something that uh, I also like that he doesn't do any introductions. Mm. I, I, we haven't reached that point yet, you know, like, uh, I don't feel comfortable, you know, just sit, sit in the studio and start, you know, talking about whatever comes your way. But in a way, uh, the way he does it, uh, is inspirational in, 
us being less formal mm. when we do our podcast. So I, I, I find it I find it uh, interesting. I love the viewpoint here because you're like pointing towards the differences between different people and this is like the ultimate uh, way of looking at the world because um, we are all different. We do things differently. We can succeed differently. Uh, we have different uh, uh, viewpoints, etc. But... Uh, uh the, the, there are things that need to unite us like science for example yeah and like uh, i'm a being, big fan of science yeah being good people since i was a kid yeah yeah i know yeah. my father is uh, a professor an engineer so i know <laughs> um <laughs> thanks to uh, thanks for the great recommendations um and thanks for the audible also uh a heads up because i'm currently uh, listening to uh, arnold's new newest uh, book Um, is it any good? Um, I think Total Recall is better. Yeah. But it's called Be Useful. Yeah, I know, I know. Which is basically, I don't know. It sounds like, I cannot put a, a label on it yet. It's like sharing his knowledge about how to, um, how to m- create win-win in, yeah. in, in his own, in his own way. But um, yeah, I've also downloaded yesterday buy back your time by by dan martel a recommendation by a friend of mine who've been on the podcast too but i want to thank hacksoft for supporting this uh particular part of the podcast they are a bulgarian software company that have their own podcast where they share what they have learned what their experiences were uh through the years creating a software company in english which might be useful for you guys Uh, their YouTube channel is called Hackcast, Hacksoft, and their podcast called Hackcast. So uh, get uh, get online and listen to their content. I'm also interviewed in the season four. We were talking about um, why is it important for IT professionals to be healthy. And it's not only for freelancers, but also for yeah, everyone sure. to take care of their health. And uh, because uh, entering the studio, you were like, is this Atlas Shrugged? <laughs> this was inspired by Atlas Shrugged, yes. And I wanted the Atlas to be strong, to have this aura of being strong, not being like Sisyphus, like being uh, like the, the rock being so heavy that he cannot like push it. Yeah. And because I believe that we carry, uh, we we carry the strength, we ca- carry the uh, internal ability to make uh, the change, to handle challenges, and to um, have all the solutions in our own hands so that's why i wanted a very strong uh, atlas here there is a you know there's a second book by ayn rand yeah about the fountainhead the architect the fountainhead. yeah the fountainhead yeah, yeah i found it uh, relevant to freelancers in a way <laughs> but by the way i was thinking about uh atlas shark recently when i was reading that walter isaacson book about elon mm-hmm. because that guy seems to be the archetype of the people Ayn Rand was writing about in Atlas Shrugged, basically. You know... The guys in the sphere or the other guys? No, I mean, like... Uh, the entrepreneurs. Was, yeah, yeah he, okay. I think, like, her idea, right, is that uh, human progress is uh, made by exceptional individuals uh, who are crazy enough, yeah. you know, and bold enough... Yeah, but they're not exceptional. Serve. They're just... I mean, ex- the exceptional, the, yeah, the yeah, perception right. of others are yeah, there yeah. exceptional. Yeah. They're just bold and brave and they have their vision, what they want to do and they don't give up and they don't give up towards uh, political pressure. Yeah, sure, sure. This is just meant. Sure. So, uh, so it made me think about, about it. Of course, I think I differ from you a little bit uh, uh, by... Basically, I don't adhere to Ayn Rand's uh, worldview, I, yeah. I have to say. But the, I libertarian, like the, uh, the libertarian way? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't. Okay. Uh, but I like the novel, uh, mm-hmm. and, I li- and I like how bold she was, you know, for the time. Um, uh, and of course, uh, when, you, when you read about people who went on their own, broke completely new ground while being hated and talked down by anybody else, that is something that will make you cry. I mean, like, this is... There is something, I think, deeply uh, uh, archetypal about it. Mm. She wrote about the archetype. 
Um, Stephen Pressfield wrote a couple of books about this hero archetype. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, some, it's a, well, it's a, like a sort of like a um, narrative structure yeah. that is present in so many works about somebody. The hero with a thousand faces. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the Campbell style. Like somebody who's, you know, taken out of the ordinary conditions, then goes through the ordeal, and then comes back to people with a gift, right? You know, someone, com new. someone comes to them to inspire them to get through this ordeal, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. he comes back and he's the hero. So, of course, I love this kind of story. It makes me cry when I, when <laughs> I realize that uh, there is somebody living out there who is sort of that thing mm. you know but of course i know or i believe that uh this worldview is very limited it's uh because it's one-sided in, in a way you know i also believe that uh uh collaboration and uh you know sort of limiting you know uh, individuals abilities to do whatever they want is important as well so you know I'm somewhere like politically somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. you know, but I still love the hero stories uh, about existing people, you know. Yeah, for me, it's inspiring. also the fiction books are um, sharing stories that may be adapted to your worldview. Like Dune is a great example. Uh, also, Atlas... What is a great... Dune. Dune, yeah, of course. Dune. Yeah. Because yeah, you're like, uh, you're reading Frank Herbert and you're like, but this is some kind of uh, fantasy. It... it Try to recognize yourself somewhere there. The situations that you face, uh, like the the hard the hardships, a anything, and you <laughs> might be like, "This is a very interesting like point of view towards the, this particular question." I started talking about Atlas because uh, when I started the podcast, my first guest was my my health mentor, uh, Lazar, who helped me get uh, get in uh, good shape when I was. 27 8 mm -hmm. 9 and then i from there on it i was unstoppable i just changed my environment changed everything that i did and it it came into the podcast and in the beginning you said something like you need to start uh in order to get better not to procrastinate not not to get into perfectionism i started my podcast with an ipad mm -hmm. and i did 200 episodes with an ipad and everyone else was like this is impossible. No one is going to listen to it. No one is going to um, uh, hear 45 one-hour discussions, 45 minutes, one-hour discussions. And now the podcasts are usually around three hours and it's like the, uh, one of the best, best... I love podcast. your story. Yeah, it's it, incredible. It, there's, uh, there, there's a lot to be to be shared. Hopefully next time you're in Sofia, we have more time yeah. over lunch or uh, something so I can share because there's so much more about it. Like the lessons that I've learned, I have so many people supporting me. Like I have Patreons, I have companies that support me. I have people that are in my team. I'm building an organization that's like a small media that creates all this. And uh, I'm learning as I go. I'm learning as I go. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, uh, when are you going to do the tools Tools for Titans uh, version of the Superhuman podcast. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not ready to write books. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not Tim Ferriss material yet. Uh, so next question would be for the importance of a website for a freelancer because uh, one of the best hosting companies in Bulgaria and on the Balkans is supporting the podcast and they would like to help uh, not only freelancers, generally people that want to have their own entrepreneurial journey or a course or anything to have their own website. So what's the importance of having a website nowadays, Yeah, Robert? Um, I would start addressing this from a slightly different perspective. Uh, if you are a freelancer mm. and you have never thought of, you know, this area, mm -hmm. try to find out what your digital footprint is. I mean, like try to Google yourself up, mm -hmm. like put your name in Google and see what are the top 10 results uh, that present you and your work. Because website is only one link there, mm -hmm. right? But there are nine other results. So with freelancers, it's more about being findable Mm -hmm. And being being trustworthy when people scan your digital footprint somehow. So it's not only about a website. It's about your social profiles. It's about your YouTube channel. It's about your, mm -hmm. I don't know, like uh, your listings on several freelance platforms, for example. Um, each of these should 
somehow, you know, tell the story who you are in a consistent and trans trustworthy way. So at the first glance, I would sort of, you know, think about it in a more broad sense. Uh, website, I believe, is very useful, uh, especially if you have a domain uh, that is that you can put anywhere um, in uh, in the footer of your email on your business card if you have any. I don't have one. Uh, or, <laughs> Me or, neither. Yeah, of course. It's like this is this is uh, something totally uh, optional for a freelancer, right? But only in Europe. I was told that uh, for freelancers in Asia or Southeast Asia, it's quite mandatory. <laughs> so there are differences, but this is almost a joke. But uh, yeah, I was told about, by a friend who is doing uh, business in China and uh, Southeast Asia that if he goes to a business meeting somewhere there, that not only he's expected to have a business card, but when he's given a business card from a senior, he's supposed to read it you know, comment on the paper, whatever. It's just part of the small talk. So he was uh, a little bit funny about it, but uh, yeah. Cultural differences. Yeah, there are, there are cultural differences. But anyway, uh, uh, I'm running uh, two freelance platforms where mm -hmm. people can have uh, open profile. So it means that uh, uh, all the contact details are published there. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyone can contact these freelancers directly. And uh, quite a big number of our members doesn't have a personal website. They only use the profile and they have a, a domain alias uh, redirected to it and it's enough for them because mm -hmm. it's well findable. It makes sense. So my general recommendation would be that uh, there are basically uh, three good uh, ways how to approach your having a website. Mm -hmm. First of first level would be a single page presentation. It may be on your own domain, you know, is like a single website, single page website, or it may be in some you know quality uh, freelance platform. And then you would like put everything by yourself, perhaps a price list or a current price, uh, your bio, your uh, your professional highlights, uh, offering mm. of your services, whatever you think is important to have there, uh, because each of us has different needs uh, for presenting ourselves. And not everybody wants to have a public price list, for example. I use it as a f sort of filter. Mm -hmm. It filters out uh, the inquiries that would be irrelevant due to price expectations difference. So uh, there are different ways how to put the one single page together. Uh, that would be one great way. So having a, like a single page with up-to-date information mm -hmm. with your picture as a freelancer, picture is way more important than a logo because clients relate to us as individuals. Faces, right? names. And there is this great quote by graphic designer Jan Tipman uh, who works in Prague. Uh, I love this quote because it's also sort of counterintuitive. He said... Uh, if I put my picture on a website, people who approach me are sympathetic to me. So I instantly like them. And it's, you know, it's a two-way street, you know. There is something in the face and in the way we uh, look that attracts people who are sort of on a similar wavelength, perhaps. Uh, it also... Uh, relates to the clothes we are wearing, you know, like mm. if I would go a uh, full jacket, you know, and a tie and whatever, I would be somebody else than probably I am because I'm quite informal. Um, uh, so all of these elements like make sense. A uh, great copy of as well, of course, if you're not a copywriter, hire one. Uh, then the second level, which is quite interesting, is about content. Mm. So having a content website, I mean a blog or like a podcast, something like where you publish something valuable, then there is like a, a sort of paradox, you know, like uh, friends of mine who are highly professional in creating websites and who some of them are even involved in uh, running search engines, Mm -hmm. They have this also counterintuitive insight that uh, regular users, they don't care that much about how websites look. 
if they contain highly valuable content. So same for podcasts. Yeah. So <laughs> so so the recommendation there would be if you have something important to share and you are willing to master the form because each form has a different needs so from the creator uh you may start with a wordpress website or whatever on your own domain just put the content out there you know like work uh, on it and it will compensate for you know not looking too great but because people people will like it and people will find it because of its value you know yeah. so make it readable make it usable but don't be concerned and much about you know uh, not spending uh, dozens of thousands of euros for uh, creating the website and then there is a third level which i would call like a fully professional website created by professionals this is usually useful for people who are way more ahead on their professional and freelance journey These are people who are I would say like top earners who may spend I I don't know like thousands t- thousands of euros or 10,000 euros for a website and then these websites tend to be more complex they they may contain I don't know like a, a glossary of terms they may contain a various sections you know they often involve some uh, um uh data architecture how to pull all these sections together and they usually require professional support because people usually who are not web designers wouldn't be able to put it all together neatly so th- this would be the third level mm. so this would be my third recommendation but of course social media are, um, are very important for most freelancers i wouldn't overdo mm. it with it you know like uh they also have downsides i wouldn't go fully call Newport here like he's really he's way too much for me yeah. lately like digital minimalism i believe is like he went overboard somehow there but uh, in general i like deep work i like uh uh uh, uh be so good they can ignore you yeah. these two books are really excellent but with digital minimalism i sort of uh, perceive that he went alarmist he went sort of you know like uh uh I've I've been involved with several researchers who were who are involved in uh in internet addiction and mm-hmm. online addiction and from from what I've learned from them and the research they send me the situation is not that grave as he presents it yeah. so so I wouldn't recommend people you know just going off the especially freelancers going uh, like leaving social media and 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 uh staying somewhere in a hut you know Yeah Definitely what not. what I would like to say here is um people often ask me how do you create a business model how do you monetize podcast and you don't monetize the podcast you you monetize your audience so the the more people listen to you the the, the right when the right people listen to you the engaged ones mm-hmm. when you know who you're talking to uh you have a monetization opportunity and the same thing for freelancers uh social media is a place where you have it's like a market like everyone goes through there and you position there and you grow an audience there you need to be in front of people to people to get to know you that you exist so uh why is easy to send uh, to sell books on amazon when when you put your book there there are people looking for books on amazon so uh identical example you put yourself on linkedin you uh, expect people to see what you do but uh going off means it's market funnel get through like check what market funnel is a marketing funnel is basically there's a number of people that you approach and there's a percentage of the people you approach that are going to become your customers the more people you approach and know about you the more customers you have simple as that yeah but anyway i like uh, call newport yeah yeah I we all do some great work i think only i have a different opinion on social yep. media you know uh, so digital minimalism was a way too much for me but i still recommend his former two yeah. books and uh well uh i like uh, a quote by two friends of mine who wrote a best selling book about social media uh, it was published in check only unfortunately but uh, you know uh they are both highly accomplished uh, social media managers mm-hmm. and i like their saying that uh 
basically social media is the democratization of the media landscape. You know, you have less people who were formerly privileged to talk to other people mm. through traditional media. Here you can have, you can be nobody, but you may have something special to present and you may have a million following. That's great about the thing that it enables people who are not privileged mm -hmm. in any way to have an audience, you know, and to present uh, their, you know, mm. uh, their value to the public. And that's in essence, I know that social media have issues that they, uh, you know, support anxiety in young people. You know, I wouldn't, uh, you know, trivialize this, you know, but in general, I believe that they are force for the good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but the problem is that the forces for the bad are using the social media without the, the moral sentiments that we have. Yeah. And this is a, a story that we are seeing in Twitter. We are, we are seeing it in Facebook. Uh, you mentioned the war. It's also uh, a lot of propaganda going there. And it's, uh, it's easier to say like, yeah, the good guys are following the rules, but the bad guys don't follow rules, which is uh, making the, the, the battle a bit more uneven. And uh, with the purpose of getting more and more people on the social media platform just to raise the capital and the value of the company, it's uh, something some, sometimes the profit is before the people. Yeah. And, uh, but it is uh, for everyone uh, to, to, to have their own opinion on this. I would like to thank Superhosting BG for helping me for all these years and hosting my own website. So if you're looking for a hosting, you're based in Bulgaria, Serbia, or one of the countries that they provide domain and hosting services, check them out. Um, lastly, awesome. lastly, my main, um, my main partners for two and a half years are e-commerce company. And some freelancers are working for e-commerce businesses or even have their own e-commerce businesses. Uh, would you have um, some kind of a, uh, idea, quote, uh, suggestion or um, advice towards e-commerce based freelancers? Um, like things to look into or like something to uh, someone to follow or anything that would be helpful for, for these people? Um, well, first of all, like lots of my freelance friends are actually involved in e-commerce industry. This is actually, uh, this has been uh, for a couple of years, especially since COVID where, where many formerly offline only companies were basically forced to go online with their goods. Uh, so it created a lot of boom. Mm. Uh, so this is quite common uh, professional uh, professional expertise among freelancers I work with. Uh, as for the as for the resources, well, uh, I have a friend who who is organizing the probably the best uh, European conference on the Europe on uh, digital marketing mm -hmm. and he has a lot of mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, good content there so uh, check out marketing festival mm -hmm. it's like they all they also have uh, online content but he's really great at getting uh, world-class speakers to Prague and Bruno it's an international conference mm -hmm. so that would be probably a uh, uh, a shout out to in Indra Faborski, who is the person behind it. Mm. Uh, he's been doing it f for 10 years by now. Wow. And uh, I think he put something really incredible uh, there uh, because he has this notion that quality trumps absolutely everything. You know, mm -hmm. he told me a couple of times how the industry works, industry of conferences, you know, how many talks, for example, on major conferences are sold. Yeah. So you are basically paying your money to get a ticket to listen to people that paid to that be there. paid to be there as speakers and who provide very little value to you actually. They are there to sell you something. Yeah. So I admire to sell you something because they invested this money yeah. to get them back. Yeah, so so uh, I'm quite aware 
uh, that, you know, having a conference that has this, you know, like the only quality first, you know, get the best speakers together and, you know, like ignore the fluff, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. how important that is, you know. So marketing festival would be a great resource. I would also recommend uh, to follow Indra on social media because mm -hmm. he's an interesting guy. He's also a freelancer, by the way, as a side project, he created one of the most, uh, you know, uh, visible channels on YouTube uh, 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 with the reviews of motorbikes. Okay. So he's traveling all around the world, you know, like uh, doing reviews of motorbikes and it's his hobby. But since he's uh, such a passionate guy, he sort of like, you know, created quite a big, uh, you know, buzz around this, uh, around this channel as well. So... Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be perhaps my my ten cents uh, on this on this arena. Uh, you know, like Czech Republic is pretty close. You know, you may fly into Prague, you may have amazing experience there. Not only going to the main conference, but they have also workshops and mm -hmm. and so on. I've been uh, there a couple of times. Uh, it's a great event, actually. There is also. Um, Another one, uh, Web Expo, uh, also in Prague. Uh, it, it, this is more about uh, web technologies. You know, it's like uh, mm. so. If I can recommend something uh, from my home country, probably. And well, uh, perhaps a third thing that's a fringe one, but uh, I don't know if you know it about me. But uh, we have a second home. We live in Spain as well. Okay. And uh, we spent every winter in Las Palmas, the current Canaria, which is like uh, our winter getaway. We, we spend there like from three to five months every year. And that city is incredible hotspot for people who work in uh, online industry. Mm. So for me, it has become uh, a place where I meet most people from the e-commerce and online industry in, every year because mm. they spend the winter there as remote workers we have some informal you know cafes like uh, sit outs on the beach you know with kids and so on i highly recommend uh, las palmas it's an awesome place it has uh, according to several resources uh it has the most stable weather uh, in the world because basically the whole year is a spring weather it's like from 22 to 32 degrees with the extremes going down to 15 or up to 35, you know, but regularly it's like between th 20 and 30, so it's not too hot. And um, it's uh, accessible uh, through uh, direct flights from mm. most European capitals. And uh, we absolutely love the city because the beach strip there is fantastic. And uh, additionally, if you can meet so many interesting people there, mm -hmm. it, it, it has this added value of uh, very ple pleasant networking with people who are from the same industry as I am. I'm also mm -hmm. an online guy. Um, most of what I do is related to some you know, digital and web projects. I also have clients who mm -hmm. work in this. So that would be my third recommendation, like uh, traveling to meet people there. That's great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Yotpo and their R&D office in Sofia are developing this software as a service tool called uh, SMS Bump used to be called. SMS Bump is a SMS marketing tool that uh, is helping one of the biggest Shopify and uh, e-commerce shops worldwide like GoPro, Patagonia, IKEA. So uh, if you are interested in joining such a company, uh, check out their careers page uh, and I have some of uh, the guys that are leading the R&D Center in Sofia being on the podcast and being part of the community of Patreons that I have. So I'm very thankful for Yotpo's support throughout these years and uh, in 2024 we're going to have um, more and more of this uh, collaboration which I'm very thankful for. So um, getting to the book because we have a couple of minutes just to to get through it uh, we we mentioned it in a bit uh you can you grab the english version yep. of it you have the english version of it we have it here in locus locus also have a discount for uh, the listeners of the superhuman podcast awesome it's the 20 percent. so guys you can get it uh with a with a discount of course with the promo code superhuman. they also have the new peter atia book Okay. Like Outlive. It has just been published. I've been uh, to right. a book fair uh, here. Yeah. And uh, it, it has just been out. 
this is great. And uh, can you describe what um, what people can find in the book uh, that's um, useful? Uh, that's useful in a way that because I I was um, getting through it, I was wondering what's inside the way of the freelancer, like uh, or the freelance way. It's I literally translate. I'm literally translating yeah. it. Uh, and I, I I I hear and read through a lot of like tools, a lot of like uh, viewpoints and approaches. Like, make sure you have a good accounting or at least someone to consult with, so you don't end up in a country where you need to be registered as a freelancer for the first purchase that you do. Uh, some of the European countries I've tried to do like drop shipping in UK and Germany for the first couple of purchases, it's not a problem, but you need to get settled in. To uh, to make it uh, to make it work, like mm-hmm. you said in Spain back yeah. in the days. So, uh, how would you describe your own book? Uh, well, um, as you said, uh, originally it's uh, it's pretty thick. Uh, uh, you know, there's not much fluff in there. Uh, it's not a book uh, based on a single idea. So mm-hmm. it's basically divided in three. Uh, parts Mm -hmm. the first part is about freelancing in general about uh i would say like the overall strategy um part of it is uh how important a good name is for a professional Mm -hmm. Uh, it's actually quite essential to long-term success uh with freelancers so i wanted to make sure at the beginning of the book not only to introduce freelancing as a subject but Mm -hmm. also to introduce how deeply we are dependent on our reputation you know it's it's a very essential concept and then the second part relates more to the individual so mm. more about the characteristics that make uh, outstanding freelancers so it's more about the psychological side about you know uh uh career strategies uh, i also recommend the cole newport book there uh so good they can ignore you yeah, yeah for example uh and then there is this uh largest uh, part uh third one mm. uh, that includes uh you know the core of the know-how of being a freelancer as a business person so there is a chapter on time management on uh, team collaboration on pricing on business negotiations on personal marketing on getting paid uh, on uh, using online uh, tools and websites to promote and present yourself uh, about financial self-management which will probably be a topic of my next book. Mm-hmm. And there is also a closing chapter that I w- don't want to spoil to readers, but that's a chapter that puts it all in a like a sort of new light or new perspective. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of like narrative arc that goes through the whole book and that puts you in a, like a position where you can digest everything that has been said, but also relate it somehow to your personal story. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, j- just a glimpse of it. Uh, I would say that the motivation of a beginning freelancer to become professional, to have the stability, is different from the ambitions of advanced freelancers, you know? Mm-hmm. They sort of, they have like a, because they already have this, they have the stability, they have the income, whatever. And I sort of try to put the whole thing in a completely new perspective in the last chapter that it's not a, the freelancing, the freelance way is not a linear way from being a beginner to being somebody who is 100% professional. Uh, That it's something like, uh, you know, like an ongoing story and when you reach the professional stage, the most interesting part begins, actually. So uh, this book is not only inspired by uh, outstanding professionals I've been in touch over the years, hundreds of them, but it's also strongly evidence-based. I mm-hmm. like evidence-based books. I like science. So it's based on data, on mm-hmm. service that we have about the freelance industry. That is, I believe, uh, what, sets the book apart from the most of the titles written for freelancers which are often very useful but are also very often based on the experience of a single individual and their peers uh, in a single profession they're sharing a story 
Yeah, there are sh- some sh- takeaways sh- from a story. I wanted to write something way more ambitious to to write about the whole industry. It's and like a use notebook. As much data. It's like a notebook. It's like it's like something that the students book. You read it. You're like, okay, like uh, separated by uh, it. It's like um, straight to the point data, data like tools, uh, instruments, yeah. uh, viewpoints. It's not like apart from your personal story getting into it uh, i have i have not read like anything that's not uh, straight to the point and nowadays mm-hmm. most books are full with stories which is not bad because in some of the stories i make i take some uh, interesting things for myself but uh, it's not a, it's not a like a non-fiction book filled like with uh, with just stories Thank you. It means a lot uh, that you say it, and then you perceive it th- this way because it was exactly my intention. Yeah, it's my. It, 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 this is my perception for this moment. And as soon as I finish the book, I'm going to um, uh, make a short, uh, good reads review on it because I know it helps. Uh, you're you're telling me that you are looking forward to your. You, you can leave it here yeah. if you want uh, to your next book. <clears throat> Yeah, Are, have you started re- writing it yet? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I'm a f- I'm in a process of uh, moving a couple of thousands notes I made for <laughs> myself into a Zettelkasten. Do you know about it? No. Uh, there is a fantastic book that will be published by Locus also. Okay. Uh, it's written by a great guy and. Uh, friend of mine I met a uh, fellow author his name is Sonke Arens uh, he's a professor at the German University mm. and he wrote a book that is titled how to take smart notes and mm-hmm. it's about the method uh, of so-called personal knowledge management uh, uh, developed by a uh, German Social, social sociologist uh, uh, Nicholas Luhmann. I, I, I hope I didn't mispronounce his name. Uh, we, he sort of like uh, developed a method to organize notes uh, about complex topics. And I decided that uh, for writing my next book, I sort of like add the new uh, mental tool to my skill set that I will create a subtle custom for the book. Uh, because I have so many notes that uh, uh, I need to sort of like connect them together into a more coherent uh, way. Uh, with this book, with the freelance way, I didn't have to do that because I was training uh, freelancers uh, and I had a training that I was developing for uh, 10 years and the outline was pretty clear from the beginning. Yeah, you had the structure. Now... Uh, with this new book that should be uh, for general public about uh, financial self-management inspired by entrepreneurs and uh, uh, freelancers who are generally, you know, more mm-hmm. exposed mm-hmm. to uh, uncertainty. I believe that this can be useful for general public. Uh, I have many notes. I have uh, like the ideas, but I mm. still need to put them in a structure that would work, uh, a sort of like narrative arc, whatever you call it. And I'm going to do the Zettelkasten work first, uh, which would take me, I believe, like a quarter of a year or half a year, basically. And then I'm going to write it. So it's a... I try to make the journey as interesting Mm. uh, and engaging and exciting as possible because uh, uh, as probably Stephen Pressfield would uh, say it, uh, each book is different. Like there is no recipe if you are not like a serial writer which i am not definitely how to you know apply everything you learned on a single book to write the next one which is about something completely different so i was thinking for a couple of years how to approach the new problem and i decided i will go with subtle custom because i believe that this is exactly the mental tool i need to do that Mm. and i highly recommend uh the book it's uh, how to take smart notes. Outstanding title. It's it's one of the best books I I've read this year. Definitely, uh, Robert. It's um, one of the things that I value a lot, and I'm looking it for myself, for myself, and from for in my in my guests, uh, is this uh, willingness to improve. Uh, 
Yeah. And this this value to keep improving that life is not you have not reached the pinnacle of success and from now on you can have rest and not learn new things and just uh stay at the top where it's lonely yeah. but you're very happy that you made it. Uh and uh, thank you very very much for sharing this in this excitement that you have about uh learning something new and then uh, valuing the tool that you're learning yeah. because for me uh I uh, later realized that making the podcast it was a tool to uh, improve myself in listening actively listening to people and so I can ask deeper questions and we can get into why is this important and how do you uh getting into my next question how do you find what what do you value and uh, the things that um uh move you forward in in like you particularly and uh what, what do you teach your kids how how to find what what is valuable for them <laughs> uh well i find many new ideas uh by reading of course mm -hmm. uh also by listening to some interesting in conversation in podcasts it has been quite a favorite format for me uh with kids uh i try to make them love books So we have this How do you make them love books? Yeah, it's easy. It's uh we have this thing uh if you go to my Facebook page, we have a sort of like a mini tradition. We, I call it Library Saturday with Kids. We have a great local library. So they have an awesome selection of graphic novels mm. of like really children books like they have a huge but a huge children section. And we go there, they pick their 10 books they want to read, and then we go to a cafe or like a chocolate place where they can, you know, drink chocolate. And we go through these books and so we read them before going to sleep. Uh, of course, the older kid, like the nine years old, he reads a lot by now. Like he reads 10 books a week, probably. <laughs> like most of them are comic novels and he likes, you know, he's highly visual and he also pains a lot uh so i sort of created uh this tradition for them that we go to the library and it became uh our routine mm. you know and that way they sort of find out that uh, they like some books more than the others and very early they develop their own reading preferences so i don't tell them what to read you know i sort of for example uh our son richard Uh, he's nine years old and he's excited about two things at the moment. Uh, one is Minecraft and one is Pokemon. <laughs> and there are, trust me, hundreds of books about Minecraft. It's crazy. I, I would never expect It's that. It's a niche, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, graphic novels, manuals, uh, you know, like uh, um, escape games, whatever you think of, th th there is. And this it's pretty much similar with the... Pokemon manga thing. So he sort of like read the whole section. I mean, like he sort of read it and then he moved on to another thing. So so I, I'm not a person telling him like, you should not read about Minecraft. It's a waste of time. You know, uh, it's go ahead. I mean, like explore whatever you like, you know, mm. and I would never judge, you know, his reading preferences by telling him to read Dostoevsky, whatever. I mean, like, he will find a way you know to mm. to read to the books that are meaningful for him perhaps later he's now reading harry potter of course like he fell in love with the lord of rings you know so uh you know it's about taking care of uh the child's soul which is different from adult soul you know mm. uh and about protecting it uh from from things that would sort of you know disrupt uh, its fragility somehow you know so kids are fragile in a way mm. and we are not overprotective parents uh uh and we are not too strict either you know so we are trying to give them as much freedom as possible part of it is traveling so yeah. for example when we arrived to sofia Uh, the first day, Sunday, we went to a bookstore. So I posted like a bookstore Sunday with kids. And they spent, I don't know, three hours in a bookstore going through books, you know, drinking something and, you know, doing mess everywhere. 
but uh that's how i do it mm -hmm. i i think and this also relates to myself that books are a great way to explore uh, new future possibilities uh of course i meet a lot of people so mm. people like you friends of mine uh my publishers people who are in new ideas mm -hmm. into new ideas they inspire me perhaps even more because they recommend me what to read and so on but in essence like uh, every time i reach a conclusion that uh, my life has to be altered uh it's quite often related to some book one way or another that's great um last thing uh, your advice on parenting from a father to a father? Uh, One thing, short. Yeah, that book thing, library thing is a good... So map your libraries. Okay. Right? Because, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I will add something more to that as well. But, you know, like libraries nowadays nowadays function differently than when i was a kid you know they are not as boring places as they were mm -hmm. you know is that they're fun you know and the people they're working they know how to treat kids usually so uh, hopefully in the capital you will have a couple of great uh, library places well the other parenting stuff would be we travel a lot with our kids mm. when our child first child richie when he was like three months old Mm -hmm. He already traveled half of the Western Europe with us wow. by car. Okay. So we took him by car. We traveled all around the place. He, of course, he doesn't remember a thing. But we create uh, photo books uh, for our kids for every year of their life. Mm -hmm. my, my, my spouse, Lenka, does it. So she creates a photo book like a Richie... Uh, year one mm -hmm. and there he has like all the memories he probably could not remember you know being fixed there as a sort of way so uh, creating these photo books as a sort of present for them for each Christmas is that they are looking forward you know uh, to it because it would enable them uh, to remember the early childhood you know it takes uh, two evenings for Lenka to compile them and it's a great present it's something deeply personal you know you have mm -hmm. to be there present to, to to do it so absolutely i know that they love this uh le love this present they're looking forward for this photo book specifically and since we travel a lot you know there are always you know a lot of stuff to be put in there you know we are we are not digital nomads precisely yeah. because we have this dual home like czech republic and and Gran canaria right so we are sort of we know that kids uh like traveling like in a quick succession for example a trip there or there but it shouldn't be too much you know like mm. they like kids our kids especially they like stable environment so the only difference is that we have two stable things and we sometimes do trips like this one to sofia yeah that's great yeah that's a good 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 example i i'm trying to tell my friends that i'm trying to take our daughter katerina with us wherever we go so uh yeah thank you thank you very much for this great advice I don't want to be like um, uh, st sticking home just to wait for her to grow up. Yeah, I want yeah. to take her places. Absolutely, absolutely. Take so. her places. Uh, it will, uh, especially when they are a bit older, uh, when they l learn to talk, uh, to see that every country is different, I think that's a very important uh, lesson for them. Opens their minds. Yeah, it opens their yeah. minds. Mm. It's It's sort of you know, widens there in the universe, yeah. you know? Yeah, agreed. All right, uh, Robert, thank you very much for being here. The layers is the last question for every podcast. It has been uh, a bit more of a rush uh, that it, compared to my usual interviews, but I'm very happy to have you. Hopefully some of the people that, it was have, a pleasure. that have been on the uh, in your book will be on the podcast too, because uh, when I started the podcast, I was thinking one day I might invite people that are coming from Western Europe or the States or uh, like different bigger markets and where they share their own stories. And we input this knowledge into the Bulgarian listeners so they know, hey, they are not that much different from us. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for, for sharing your story. The last question is, uh, as, a, as an as a person that's not uh, Bulgarian, but being here, um, what would be your one advice or one way that uh, for us to change our country for the better? 
Well, I'm I'm too shortly here to have actually any impressions on that. You know, uh, first of all, <laughs> I I really enjoy uh, Sofia the way it is. You know, it's it reminds me of Spain. It has a certain, it has a similar vibe. I would say mm. so. I wouldn't change Spain and I wouldn't change Bulgaria Is it in any manana, way. Manana vibe. Uh, mm, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, no, I think that people are, uh, they spend uh, a lot of time outside, I believe, even though you have pretty cold weather these days. I was quite surprised how many people are out there in the streets mm. uh, uh, sitting out there. I mean, like, you know, like sitting in cafes out there. I mean, like in December, you know? Yeah, these people are keen on their cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, exactly. The, the Spain is like uh, pretty much similar in this regard. So I wouldn't change that, that many things. Uh, but I would go to freelancing uh, as a topic, you know? Mm. Uh, important motif, uh, why we do these uh, freelancers on the road, uh, 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 meetup series is that I believe that there are not enough uh, events for freelancers in most European countries, you know? Mm. So my only suggestion would be perhaps that if there are freelancers uh, listening to this uh, uh, interview, mm. my first recommendation that would improve, you know, Bulgaria in terms of freelancing meet up as often as you can create a meetup group whatever like meet up very informally just do it like talk to others uh it may be also centered around you mm. perhaps why not you are a freelancer yourself so you would be a great uh first speaker on such a meetup and uh, we did this one in networking premium they were really awesome like i really like the co-working place so thank you for that uh networking premium colleagues uh, you were great. And uh, second recommendation, how to support a, you, mm. you know, local freelance economy would be whenever you find an article on a podcast episode uh, uh, of a freelancer talking about their business, talking about their business experience, talking about the freelancing experience, share it. Make it spread, you know. Like uh, don't only, if you are a freelancer, don't only share your point of view, Try to highlight others and highlight the quality you see in others. Mm -hmm. This will make uh, the phenomenon, you know, being more recognized and more connected, which is uh, the most important thing in the end. Because mm -hmm. if people know that freelancers are different, that they uh, have a very specific way of running their business, it makes also the clients more informed and more... Uh, willing to value the contribution the freelancers provide you know so they it's important to have informed informed customers same thing applies for podcasters yeah, when i was exactly. starting i was thinking okay we need to spread there must be more podcasts so more people learn about podcasting so more uh advertisers know about being yeah. able so it's like growing an ecosystem isn't it yeah absolutely great that's what i mean that's great example i i adore the power of environment power of communities yeah so uh thank you very much for contributing to ours uh, freelance community there's this place called bansko which is one of the best uh, digital nomad it. play places in uh, europe there are a lot of uh, freelancers going there i know that you're heading towards btv so i'll be letting you go on your way towards uh, other interviews Uh, and switching to Bulgaria now, уважаеми приятели, благодаря ви, че бяхте с нас и този вторник на гости им беше Робърт Влах, авторът на книгата Пътят на предприемача, човек с огромен опит в фрилансинга, консултант на фрилансъри по целия свят, човек, който а, живее в, в Чехия, в Испания, разказани толкова много за нещата, през които е преминал, хората с които е говорил, надявам се, че би било интересно. Ако искате да разберете повече, последите го в неговите социални мрежи или потърсете в инфото към епизода малко повече информация. Знаете, аз свърх човекът с Георги Ненов всеки вторник ви разказва истории, които вдъхновяват, така че ще се видим следващия вторник в платформата, в която ще гледате подкаста, който отново ще ви разказва истории, които вдъхновяват. 